Okay, so I want you to imagine the system that I've sketched here. The idea is that you have a crystal lattice made out of large ions, and there's one missing. And in that gap, you've got a hydrogen atom. And that hydrogen atom is distorted by the Coulombic field of the ions. And specifically, we're going to do a calculation under the condition of a particular limit on this system, where the ions are so big that that hydrogen atom is actually pretty far away from all of them. And therefore, they don't see any of the specifics of the shape of the ions. They just see a Coulombic charge with the charge of the ion. And we're also going to imagine that that charge isn't all that high. So the combination of a significant distance and the not particularly large charge of the ions means not only does the hydrogen atom only see Coulomb fields, but they're weak Coulomb fields, to the point where we're justified in expanding the Coulomb potential to quadratic order, and we'll still get a decent answer. And of course, we're pretending that the ions farther away are too far away and too weakly charged to matter, and we're also assuming that the ions on either side in each of the three dimensions are the same. Now, the specific calculation we're going to do here on this system in the particular limit that I've described is as follows. We're going to calculate the first order perturbative correction to the ground and first excited states of the hydrogen atom induced by the crystal lattice that it's sitting in. And we're going to do this using standard quantum mechanical time independent perturbation theory. Now you may be wondering why we would be so interested in such a specific analysis of a rather bizarre system. And the answer, of course, is basically pedagogical. It's not just a really great example of degenerate time-independent perturbation theory. It also provides us with a great opportunity to use the Wigner-Eckhart theorem in a real application to lessen our workload. However, it's not purely pedagogical. If you wanted to experimentally test quantum mechanics in a way that was a step beyond just solving the hydrogen atom in free space, this kind of a system might be something you'd study. If set up correctly, it's a system that you can actually relatively easily make a prediction on, and it's something that's at least conceivable to perform in the lab. Now, in this experimental picture, the reason why we would be interested in making predictions for specifically the ground state and the first excited states is because that is the smallest calculation you can do that actually gives you enough information to predict at least one of the actual spectral emission bands that you might see from hydrogen in this crystal lattice. Pedagogically, we're interested in it, of course, because it gives us a chance to do degenerate perturbation theory, and it's actually only in the first excited states that we even need the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. With all of that justification, we're left with this complete Coulomb potential for the external field imposed on the hydrogen atom by the ions. We can see that each of the terms for each of the three different directions are by form the same. The only thing that varies is the specific values of the Q's and D's. But that doesn't really matter for a Taylor expansion because we're leaving them general variables anyway. So we really only have to do this once. The first step is to get this written in a form that's a bit easier to deal with, which in this case means explicitly expressing it in terms of square roots. From there, it turns out to be useful to convert the quantities in this denominator here into dimensionless ones, and then to compute this square. From there, we see that there's actually an r squared over d squared showing up, which simplifies things down nicely. Then from there, we can define some constants that makes the expression simple enough to very trivially Taylor expand, giving us this result here if we truncate it to second order. Now, technically, we're supposed to be going to second order in a distance variable variables, so like r squared and x, and not really to second order in these a quantities, but if we truncate it at second order, we do know that we'll at least definitely get all of the second order terms in these distance variables, even though we'll also get some more, which we can just ignore later. If we then insert these quantities back in and expand it out and refactor, we arrive at this, and we do find some cancellations which simplify things down immediately. More simplification can be achieved by ignoring the fourth order terms that show up here, and also by combining any remaining like terms that just don't happen to cancel. That leaves us with this. 
It's then useful to define a constant like this because this product keeps reoccurring and few of the parameters in here end up showing up independently, which leaves us with this very condensed expression, which I've set equal to v bar so that I don't have to keep repeatedly using these roughly equals. Now, as I noted before, because of the form equivalence of the different terms in the potential, we have these results for those other terms, which ultimately gets us this expression for the complete quadratic order approximation to the perturbing potential, where I've defined one more constant there. And with this, we're ready to actually start calculating the correction to the hydrogen energy levels. There is, of course, only one state at the ground energy level. There's no degeneracy, so we can proceed with non-degenerate perturbation theory, which is pretty convenient. We just have that the first order perturbative correction is roughly equal to this, where it still has to be roughly, even though this notation already accounts for the fact that it's only first order, because we're also approximating the perturbing potential, too. So it actually is correct to say approximately there. Actually inserting the approximate perturbed potential that we calculated immediately gets us this expression, which might seem like a lot of integrals to do, but of course the ground state is spherically symmetric, which immediately means that these must be true. And that simplifies it down at least to just one integral, but in fact it's actually even easier than that. When we substitute that in, we see that all the parts of this quantity here that we might possibly have to do an integral for actually just cancels out, and we're left with our answer as just v naught, and that's the first part of it. We know what the first order ground state energy correction is according to the quadratic approximated perturbing potential. Now with the ground state finished, we're ready to move on to the first excited states. Calculating the correction to the first excited states is more difficult because there's a fourfold degeneracy. While of course we're still going to be using time independent perturbation theory because the potential hasn't changed, we must use degenerate perturbation theory, which leaves us with the possibility of having to diagonalize a matrix. And we do actually end up having to do that, although it's not as bad as a full 4x4 four four matrix. As per the prescription of degenerate first order perturbation theory, the matrix that we need to diagonalize to get the energy corrections is this one. At first sight, calculating this matrix here seems like a daunting task because there are 10 distinct matrix elements and four non-trivial terms in the approximate potential for a total of something like 40 multivariable integrals to calculate. Fortunately, however, v-bar is clearly made out of individual terms that can be written in terms of linear combinations of spherical harmonics, which are spherical tensors. We can therefore significantly reduce our workload with these integrals by using the wigner eckhart theorem. The list of spherical harmonics we actually end up needing to rewrite the potential in terms of spherical tensors are actually just these. And you may ask, how do I know it? And the honest answer is simply that I've done the problem before. Now the easiest way to work out the right substitutions is actually not to look at x squared, y squared, z squared and r squared individually, but to look at these linear combinations of them. They come out of the spherical harmonics more directly. And again, I know that because I've done this before. We can start by evaluating this quantity. If we come over here to y02, we see that the first factor cancels that normalization constant, and the r squared comes in here and turns that first term into a 3z squared. And with that, we have that first quantity we were looking for coming out right away. Now, I've done this highlighting here with this one label to denote that this is actually an equation that we're going to use later. So we're actually getting two useful things out of this. Prior experience tells me that the best way to find the two remaining desired linear combinations is to rewrite these spherical harmonics by multiplying and dividing by r squared, which very quickly gets it expressed in terms of x's and y's. We can then solve for and multiply out this square to get us this compelling result. From there, we can see that this combination of spherical harmonics gets us almost all the way to the answer we're looking for. Dividing by 2 gives us the second key ingredient we need, which I've called equation number 2. It turns out that if we take this specific linear combination of equations 1 and 2, 
we find this result for one of those key linear combinations of square distance variables that we were looking for. And we can actually find a third simply by taking a slightly different linear combination of the same two equations. And with that, we can finally rewrite the potential completely in terms of spherical harmonics, which we've got right here. And now that we finally have the potential expressed in terms of spherical tensors, we can move on to applying the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. The first thing to notice about the Wigner-Eckhart theorem is that a lot of these coefficients are zero. And as a result, a lot of the matrix elements that we actually need to evaluate are immediately zero based purely on that fact. If we think about which one of these are non-zero, it's pretty easy to extract these selection rules. Now if we make both of these things specific to the problem at hand, we arrive at this. Given these selection rules, the task now is to consider the cases that do satisfy them, the cases that aren't automatically zero given zero value Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. To do that, we need to remember the list of states that we're dealing with and the various spherical tensors that actually do show up in this potential expression. If we go state by state and term by term, we actually find six matrix elements that are immediately evaluatable without having to use the Wigner-Eckhart theorem or doing any integrals. And that works out because y0,0 is just a constant, so you can pull it out, and then orthogonality handles the rest. Unfortunately, however, this doesn't handle all of the remaining matrix elements. There are a total of four of them that aren't immediately evaluatable and that correspond to non-zero Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. However, there still is a simplification to be found by further applying the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. Given all of what turns out to vanish given the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, or is immediately evaluatable, it turns out that the only one of these universal factors that actually matters is for the case of L prime equals L equals 1 and K equals 2. There are other cases that would in general show up in this problem, but we've already handled every matrix element associated with those. So all we have left to deal with is this one. We can also see that we only have one R squared expectation value because every single one of these remaining states has n equal to 2 and L equal to 1. Therefore, primarily because of the Wigner-Eckhart theorem, we have reduced what would have been something like 40 multivariable integrals to just one. Now, unfortunately, we will have to evaluate a multivariable integral to calculate the one of these that we need and the one of those that we need. However, we don't actually need to do two separate integrals. If we look up at the form of this potential and think about taking hydrogen atom matrix elements of this, we see that we're only ever going to need the product of these two quantities. We don't actually need to know them independently, and we can calculate that product with just a single integral. Therefore, primarily because of the Wigner-Eckhart theorem, we have reduced what would have been something like 40 multivariable integrals to doing just one. You can see why this theorem is said to be so important. It really does save a lot of time. I've done the evaluation of this integral. Actually computing it is little more than an exercise from Calc 3. Combining this result with these non-zero Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, these matrix element values, and knowledge of which ones are zero from the Wigner-Eckhart theorem and this list of two right there, we can actually start evaluating the potential matrix elements. V1010 straightforwardly works out like this. I've included the simplification to avoid confusion. We can see for all the work that it took it's not actually that complicated. V11 looks similar but isn't exactly the same. Hang on, I just noticed that this is supposed to be on the inside of the parentheses. Okay, there we go. V1010 is fixed and it doesn't look like I've got that problem anywhere else. Continuing on, V11 ends up working out similarly, except there's a plus sign here and a factor of 6. V1 minus 1, 1 minus 1 is actually equal to V1111. Fortunately, we only have two non-zero off-diagonal elements, so we don't have to diagonalize a full 4x4 matrix. 
But uh, regardless, either way, the actual calculation is essentially the same as all of the diagonal elements. And that leaves us with this complete V bar matrix. All we have to do is address the fact that we're doing degenerate perturbation theory and the matrix has come out non-diagonal. Of course, the solution is to diagonalize it. Calculating the eigenvalues is pretty quick, as is the eigenvectors, and that gives us this diagonalized matrix and therefore these energy corrections. One can see from these energy corrections that the fourfold degeneracy is completely broken. One gets four non-degenerate states, and because the original matrix was off-diagonal, some of those non-degenerate states are superpositions of the original basis states. Now let's look at some special cases. Let's say beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 are actually all equal. Well, then we don't actually have to diagonalize anything. It ends up not only being diagonal, but all the diagonal elements are the same. So none of the degeneracy is actually broken in that case. However, if we relax this condition a little bit like this, we again find that the matrix is immediately diagonal, but we don't find that the degeneracy is completely preserved. In this case, the fourfold degeneracy splits into two non-degenerate states and a two-fold degeneracy down here. And with that, we're done with this problem. We've explored it completely. I hope it's helped you better understand how the Wigner-Eckhart theorem can be used to save a huge amount of time in actual applications. And I hope it also gave you a rather interesting bit of practice with time-independent perturbation theory. Thanks for watching.